Good day, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Outcome Evaluation Step-by-Step. -step. I'm Mike Lasecki with Luca Partners. I'll be the moderator for the webinar today. Joining me is Christina Titus, representing CCTA, that is the Center's Collaborative for Technical Assistance, and Lori Wingate from Evaluate, who will present today's content. Christina, please tell us a little bit about CCTA. Thank you. This webinar is co-sponsored by the CCTA, the Center's Collaborative for Technical Assistance, an NSF ATE funded grant. CCTA's original purpose was to respond to a request from the Department of Labor to the NSF and to have ATE centers provide technical assistance services to DOL tax grantees. And now that tax grants are over, we are focusing strictly on helping NSF grantees and proposal writers. Our deliverables are to provide technical assistance webinars, workshops, and best practice documents. You can locate these, these at the URLs on this slide. CCTA partners are National Center for Convergence Technology, CTC, at Collin College in Frisco, Texas. They were the, were the lead. South Carolina ATE National Resource Center at Florence Darlington Technical College in Florence, South Carolina. Flor Florida ATE Center at Hillsborough Community College in Tampa, Florida. And BioLink Next Generation National ATE Center for Biotechnology and Life Sciences at City College of San Francisco in San, uh, San Francisco, California. CCTA com will complete its work on 731-19, and we are very happy to co-host this final webinar entitled Outcome Evaluation Step-by-Step, -step, along with Lori Wingate and Evaluate. Thanks very much, Christina. We appreciate the collaboration with CCTA over the years. Now, folks, we'd also like to thank ATE Central, the information hub for the National Science Foundation's ATE program, for making this webinar possible through their webinar hosting service. You can see more about ATE Central at their URL, atecentral.net. Evaluate is the Evaluation Support Center for the National Science Foundation's Advanced Technological Education Program. You can visit Evaluate website to access their webinars, resource library, blog, and results from the annual survey of ATE projects. You can see their URL there at the bottom of the screen. Materials. The slides for this webinar are already posted on Evaluate's website, along with a handout with key points from the webinar. You can access these materials by clicking on the link on the right-hand side of your screen at any time. Notice that we'll take you to a new browser window, so don't forget to come back to the webinar. This webinar is being recorded, and a link to the recording will be emailed to you in a few days. I'd like to point out that the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. That's all the housekeeping items for now, so I'll turn things over to Lori. Go ahead, Lori. Well, thank you, Mike. And as uh, you mentioned, Mike, I am director of Evaluate, which is the Evaluation Support Center for the National Science Foundation's Advanced Technological Education Program. And I would like to thank Christina and everyone at CT. CCTA for inviting me to talk with you all about outcome evaluation. Now, before we jump into outcome evaluation, I do want to take just a moment to talk about the difference between process and outcome evaluation. So when we're talking about process evaluation, we are talking about evaluating the activities that projects carry out. So that's going to include materials or project, products they create um, and use in service delivery. In contrast, when we talk about outcome evaluation, we are referring to determining and evaluating the changes a project brings about through its activities and products, whether those are intended or unintended positive or negative outcomes. So a process evaluation will look at things like the quality of program content and materials or even facilities, if uh, that's applicable, extent of reach to intended and other audiences, the adequacy of the project design, uh, the level of participant satisfaction. 
On the other hand, outcome evaluation will focus on, again, changes brought about through those things. So that may include things like uh, changes in individual attitudes, knowledge, skills, competence, behavior, so at the individual level. Or we may look at broader social or economic conditions. So, uh, and those may even be things like things related to public health or the, or the environment. So there's going to be five basic steps in an outcome evaluation. So um, unless you're doing what's called a goal-free evaluation, the first step is going to clearly define a project's intended outcomes. And once those are defined, you can move on to developing the evaluation questions, and those are going to frame the outcome evaluation. Then we need to really think thoroughly plan and think through data collection and beyond. So not just how you will gather data, but how you will use the data to answer the evaluation questions. And then we collect and analyze those data. And finally, we interpret the results. That is, we're going to make meaning of the data and the findings and actually answer the evaluation questions. We are going to address these steps in three sections of the webinar. Now, you may notice the one step we're not really going to get into here is to collect and analyze data. So that's where evaluators are going to put their social science research skills into action. But we're going to go through the other steps uh, in a pretty detailed way. Now, there are question breaks after each of these sections. So at any point, uh, if you have a question that comes to mind, go ahead and type it in the chat box, and Mac, Mike is going to keep track of those, and he will um, share those questions with me at the breaks. All right, so how do you define intended outcomes and identify evaluation questions? Well, first, I just want to make sure we're really crystal clear about what we mean by an outcome. So a project outcome is any change that's directly or indirectly brought about through activities, project activities and products. So in education context, again, we're typically expecting changes at the, at, uh, in individual knowledge, skills, attitudes, and behavior. That may translate down the road into broader social or economic uh, improvements. In contrast, an activity is what the project does, so the actions it takes to bring about outcomes. It may be, it's how change is set in motion, but it's not the change itself. Now, a goal, uh, it's in, we want to consider goals as well. So a goal can be any achievement that's sought by the project. And it's very important to realize that project goals can focus either on outcomes or activities or both. Let's look at that. So an activity goal is going to be about what the project aims to do. An outcome goal is about what difference it hopes to make in the world. For example, a project like mine, which is a resource center on evaluation, could have an activity goal focused like this, to provide four webinars, webinars a year serving 1,000 people. We could also have an outcome goal that looked like this for webinar participants to improve their evaluation knowledge and practices. So both of these are legitimate goals. We just never want to assume that outcomes and goals are always one and the same. I think this is a fairly common misunderstanding. And it's a really important point before we move on, so I want to make sure you can all spot the difference. So on the next few slides, I'm going to share some examples of real goal statements from abstracts of real projects that I got from the National Science Foundation's award database. I'll present one goal on a slide, and I'll ask you to read it, and then a poll will appear that will ask you to answer whether you think this statement is an activity goal or an outcome goal or perhaps a mix of the two. So we'll go to the first one, which states that the goal of the project is to increase the supply of qualified cybersecurity professionals for industry and government. Now, I also want to point out, Mike, I think you can go ahead and put the poll up now. And while that's going up, I want to point out that whenever you see a color border like this one, it's going to be a cue to you that you're going to be asked to do something, to be active in this webinar. So again, we're just asking you to read the goal statement and answer in the poll whether you think that it's mostly about an activity, an outcome, or both. And we do want to make sure you are using the poll buttons and not the chat box to answer in for these polls. see a lot of people answering. Let's see, we have 167 people on the webinar. That's wonderful, so it'll take a little while for everyone's answers to get registered.
Colleagues, we might have an, an audio issue. Hold on for just a second. Laurie, are you there? Colleagues, we're just troubleshooting an audio issue with Laurie for, hold on just a second. I, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, now you're back, Laurie. Okay, Please. I don't know what happened. Sorry about that. Um, so I'll no just, problem. I'm not sure how much was lost, but I, I'll just say, again, so because these activities were uh, focused on increasing the number of cybersecurity professionals out there in the world, and that's a change in workforce conditions, that this really is an outcome goal. And we have a few more um, that we can get the hang of this. So here's the, the second of four we're going to share. This one states that the project goal is to develop an associate's degree in mechatronics, incorporating pathways from local high schools into the degree offerings at three partner colleges. So again, uh, you know what to do here. We're using the poll buttons, not the chat. All right, looks like a lot of people are getting their answers in. Those numbers are still going up. It's wonderful to see so many people on this webinar from so many different places. Thank you for coming. So Mike, whenever you think's a good time, go ahead and broadcast the results. There they are. Oh, OK. I'm never sure if, I can, if I'm seeing what everyone else is seeing. OK. So I'm going to go ahead. We had 63%, 64% um, select activity, and a few thought it was both. So let's deconstruct that. So creating a degree program really is an activity. So it's a large and important activity for sure, but it's still the doing of the project. So think, consider this. If you create the degree program and it's not utilized by people, there are no outcomes in terms of the changes of what you know students know, think, or do. So this really is an activity goal, and the activity was to create that degree program. Let's do another one. So. This one states that the project has the overarching goal of increasing awareness of opportunities in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics for women under, and underrepresented minorities. So we can put the poll up again, and you can make your selection there. Is today? I think today might be the first day of spring. If so, happy spring. It's still kind of wintry here in Kalamazoo. Looks like outcome is the popular choice here. 86% Let me broadcast writing. the results now. OK. OK, they're seeing it now, Lori. OK, wonderful. So 88% and growing selected an outcome. So um, if you were tentative about saying this, an out, uh, this was an outcome, it looked a lot like that was definitely uh, where most people going are going. But if you struggled with this, um, it's you know, it, it is an outcome because it's a change in what people know about STEM discipline. But the statement, as many of you, uh, some of you may have noticed, it really covers a whole lot of ground. So all of science, all of technology, all of engineering and math for all women and underrepresented minorities. So this is a very grandiose goal. Um, it really does lack the specificity we'd want to see in an intended outcome statement that could serve as the basis of an outcome evaluation. But it is outcome focused because it's about a change in what people know. We have just one more. Oh, I forgot to advance that, but that was the debriefing. The, we were looking for increasing awareness, would, which would be a change in what people know. Now we'll go to the next one. Final example a little bit longer. So the project's goal is to build a sustainable program to enhance process technology education by introducing new hands-on opportunities through the use of lightweight, extremely low-cost, miniature industrial equipment with a small footprint that fits on a standard desktop or which can be taken home for use in homework assignments. That is quite a mouthful. So let's go ahead and put the poll up. This is kind of complex. It may take a, another moment to think through this and register your answer. I think you guys are getting the hang of this. I see a little bit more of a split here than normal between activities and and uh, uh, both an activity and an outcome goal. We're broadcasting the results now. Great. So everyone's seeing that. So pre a pretty interesting split there with people picking activity or both activity and outcome. 
So we can clear the poll and let's debrief on this one. So this one really is quite activity focused. It's about creating the program and using a specific kind of equipment. So it's not getting at what's supposed to be different in the world because of these activities. So I just want to point out that this exercise wasn't, the point of this was not to criticize these goals. These are perfectly fine, respectable goals, right? The point is that goals aren't always outcome focused. So we want to be really careful to avoid assumptions that evaluating goal achievement and evaluating outcomes are one and the same. So thanks for playing along with that. That was great. So when defining intended outcomes for a project, as the basis for a pro outcome evaluation, we want to see specific realistic statements about what is expected to change for individuals or groups in relation to the need that the project is addressing. So any outcomes that are put forth as the focus of an outcome evaluation uh, in your future work, I suggest you put them up against this definition or something similar um, before you proceed with evaluation planning. Now for the rest of this webinar, we are going to use a case that's based on a real project. It's called Growing a New Generation of Energy Technicians and Professionals. So the proposal for this project is used by NSF in mock panel reviews. And Celeste Carter from NSF, she was kind enough to share it with me for teaching purposes. I like really like to use real examples. In the rationale for this project, the proposers um, shared a quote from a report by the Institute for 21st Century Energy. It states that our energy industry employs millions of people today, yet nearly half of this workforce is expected to retire in the next 10 years. We need additional education and training programs that, that enable the American energy sector to attract and retain a new generation of human capital. So this project in real life had five goals, but for efficiency's sake in this webinar, we're going to just consider the first three. So the first is to improve and expand academic rigor and relevance across core technology curriculum and wind energy technology specific curriculum. Goal two is to design and put into action wind renewable energy career pathways. And goal three was to enhance and expand recruitment, retention, and placement efforts across the technology programs. So here are those goal statements. I'm not going to ask you to answer a poll about what kinds of goals these are, because I know you're all pros at that right now. I just want to highlight the key words and point out that these really are action-oriented. It's the doing of the project. So these goals are, in fact, activity goals. Now, a great way to help you define outcomes in a situation like this, where the goals are defined in terms of activities, it's helpful to develop a logic model, which is just a graphic depiction of how a project expects it, its activities to bring about change. And not just the long-term des ultimate desired outcome, but multiple levels of outcomes from short to long term. And we're going to use a logic model in this webinar just as a tool for determining outcome evaluation questions. I'm not going to address how to create a logic model, but we do have links to good resources on that topic in our webinar handout which again, if you would like to get along with the slides, is available by clicking that resources, word resources there in the, to the right of the slides. So we're going to take those activities, our activity goals from the project, and just put them right into the activity column in our logic model like this. And for this project, the desired long-term outcome is pretty easily inferred from that quote that I shared with you from the rationale from, for the project, the project seeking to increase the supply of workers to the energy sector. So that goes nicely here in the long-term outcome section of the logic model. Now that leaves a big gap between activities and the desired long-term outcome. So we need to identify some interim outcomes to connect those dots. Then we're not going to be in an all or nothing situation for the outcome evaluation. And importantly, gathering data on these interim outcomes will also shed light on the project's progress toward the long-term outcome, and maybe even reveal opportunities for improvement along the way. Now, this process of filling in these gaps and articulating how a project's activities lead to outcomes is really best done by the evaluator engaging the project stakeholders to build a logical case for how those activities are going to translate into outcomes. Now, please do not feel like you have to read all the content of these boxes at this point. I'm going to highlight the relevant information as we proceed. 
So here's what I would recommend as the focus of the evaluation, uh, outcome evaluation. You'll notice I didn't highlight the, one, the first box under short-term outcomes, and that's just because it's really about instructors changing their, um, the way they're teaching, and that's definitely an outcome, and it's definitely important, but it's not the main focus um, for this project, which is really about changing things for students and employers, not faculty. So this would be important. It should be monitored and reinforced, but I'm just not including it as a major focus of the outcome evaluation. But that leaves us still with four outcomes that focus on changes for students and employers, and these, this is what we're going to focus on. And so now we can use this logic model to develop specific outcome evaluation questions. So I'm highlighting the second short-term outcome, students utilize career pathways. And this may lead you to want to ask a question like, did students use career pathways by the project? But that would basically be a yes or no question. It means we would have to determine where that dividing line is between, yes, they used it, no, I didn't. So it's kind of, again, a pass-fail situation, all or nothing. So my advice is to avoid yes-no evaluation questions. It's probably not how you really want to answer the question or even intend to, so don't even ask it that way. So I would suggest a question that looks more like this one. To what extent are students using career pathways established by the project? So there's we can actually answer in a more nuanced way and answer more on a continuum. Give us a little more latitude for interpretation. So for the next question, we might be inclined to ask a question like, how many students use, or persisted in these programs? Again, this, or similarly, this would, the logical answer to this type of question would be a number. We want to avoid number questions, a number because a number isn't a conclusion. It's not a reasoned judgment, which is what we want evaluation questions to, to be. So I would also suggest that you avoid questions you can answer with a number. But we could ask a question like this. What, is the, what impact is the project having on student diversity, enrollment, and persistence? Now, there's still a lot going on in this question, so we would need to unpack it further. But this is more of the kind of big picture question we're looking for, rather than a question that calls for a single number or data point or a yes or a no. Now, for this midterm outcome, I would suggest that the evaluation question focus on the extent to which students are gaining competencies needed by energy industry employers. And we can ask a similar question about the extent to which the project is increasing the supply of qualified technicians to the energy sector. So I hope at this point it's apparent how we'll have a much richer outcome evaluation if we're investigating outcomes at multiple levels, not just our ultimate desired outcome. And I also hope that you see how a logic model can really be an effective device for defining these levels of outcome and then mapping evaluation questions onto those outcomes. So some points to sum up here, uh, make sure that you have clear and appropriate statements about intended project outcomes before proceeding with an outcome evaluation. It's also a good idea to identify multiple levels of outcomes so you aren't putting all of your eggs in, a, in one basket of those long-term outcomes. You want to orient evaluation questions um, to those outcomes. And ask questions that allow for a range of conclusions, not a just a yes, no, or a pass, fail kind of a situation. And I would just offer this bonus <laughs> tip. Always include a, another a question like, what, uh, what are the project's unintended positive or negative side effects, if there are any? Um, you don't want to get so focused on the intentions of the project that you would overlook the unexpected in your data. So having a question like this in the mix can really serve as a reminder to look to look, be on the lookout for the unexpected. Um, we do have some good resources that can help you with some of these things um, on our resource handout, which again, you can get to by clicking on the, the resources link to the right of the screen. Um, we are going to have a question break next, so if you have questions and haven't typed them in, go ahead and do that. Um, but the first resource here is the Getting to Outcomes Manual by the RAND Corporation. And chapter eight of that document is, has a really nice overview of outcome evaluation.
And next are a couple of uh, resources on logic models, including a logic model template and the University of Wisconsin Extension's free online course on logic models and many other resources that they have, which are really good. You can also check out the evaluation questions checklist, which defines criteria for good evaluation questions and also uh, suggests what to avoid in evaluation questions. And this last one is the only non-open access resource on our handout. It's chapter eight of Michael Quinn Patton's Essentials of Utilization Focused Evaluation. And it's definitely worth a read. He has a great discussion on how to work with stakeholders to define meaningful program evaluations. Uh, so, I mean, meaningful program outcomes. Um, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Mike for your questions. And there we go. Thank you, Lori. Several interesting questions uh, occurring in the chat window and has to go around, it goes around this idea of what you were just talking about, like numbers. There's some confusion. At, at one point you seemed to say numbers were good and the other point it seemed to say they, they weren't a single number wasn't really the answer and yet you want numbers. Could you recap that briefly for us again? So, yeah, I'm sorry about that. I have to say I got a little bit distracted with there, so I'm not surprised you were confused. Um, so what we want to avoid is framing an evaluation question in a way that prompts for a single number. So we could ask um, a question like, uh, how many people attended this webinar? Well, how many people are on this webinar? 183. What, you know, so if you answer a question, an evaluation question, with a number, it's what is that? So we, we want to be, able, an evaluation question should tap into a some larger issues that we're trying to address that calls for a conclusion, a reasoned judgment about something. So uh, the number of people attending this webinar would be one indicator of reach, for example, but it's not, a, it's not where we want our evaluation questions to be. So if, for example, you find yourself uh, coming up with a whole bunch of um, questions that can be answered with numbers, chances are those are indicators of something larger. So you want to step back and say, what is this larger thing that we're measuring? And that's where you want your evaluation questions to focus. So data points, numbers, great for, uh, you know, I love quantitative data, I'm not discouraging that, but we want to lift up from there and what's the larger question we want to answer. I think that helps, Lori, because suddenly in my mind, the distinction came between an indicator of something as opposed to the answer. So that, that really makes sense. So thank you for that. That's right. Uh, one of the chat comments came in, as we create our reports about outcomes, who do those reports go to? Do they go to the funding agency? Do they go to the project team? Who Who is the evaluator beholden to? That's what the question says. Sure, that's a really good question. And um, I, can, I will speak to the NSF context, yes. not any other context. Um, so in the NSF context, as, as is probably similar in other situations, you have multiple stakeholders. So typically an evaluator, is, a project level evaluator is hired by the project and is hired to serve the interests of the project um, and, and, you know, prioritize that project's information needs, for example. But at the same time, that evaluator needs to be cognizant of that NSF is also a stakeholder, what is NSF interested in, in the program officers interested in learning about. So typically the way it happens in, or I think the way it's supposed to happen, at least in the ATE program, is the evaluator delivers a report to the project leaders. The project leaders in turn are responsible for sharing that report with their program officers. So the, the, uh, the primary client is the, for the evaluator is the project leader, but the program, NSF and the program officers are definitely extremely important stakeholders whose, whose information needs also need to be considered. Makes sense. You know, Laurie, we're perfectly on time at this part of the webinar. There'll be other question breaks. Why don't you go ahead and take us forward? I will do that. And I did see somebody was asking about where the resources are. And there's a, uh, under web links in the middle of your screen, if you just click on the word resources, that will take you to um, Evaluate's webpage. And if where you land, if you just scroll down, there are links to slides and Excellent. handout. 
All right, let's move on to section two. So thanks for those questions. I'm sure there'll be more rolling in. Uh, the next two sections are a little bit shorter. Um, this section is about planning for data collection and beyond. And I, I say beyond because this step isn't just about figuring out how to get the data. It's also about thinking ahead to how those data will be used to answer the evaluation questions. So the data collection plan elements I'm going to review with you all are probably going to be pretty familiar to a lot of you. What might be different is that I am recommending that you plan data collection around specific evaluation questions. So I think too often data collection plans get really detailed with things, uh, regard to things like sampling and methods and instruments. And when you get into the details of those things, it can be really easy to lose sight of why you're gathering those data in the first place, what questions you're trying to answer with evidence. Basically, you really need to lay out a clear-cut plan for how you want to answer each evaluation question. So for each evaluation question, we want to specify first what are the indicators that will be used. And we just ch talked about that a little bit. But the, this is what you will measure, again, that's indicative of the outcomes of interest in the evaluation. For example, if you're surveying students, and that's pretty common in this context, are you measuring their satisfaction with the program, their self-assessment of their competence, their employment plans? So too often we see descriptions of methods without information about what's really going to be measured, what constructs are going to be measured. So that's why we want to talk about indicators independently of how that information will be obtained, or at least we want to be clear about what we're going to measure. So once you have defined what will be measured, then we need to specify what information will be obtained and using what means. So this is where you will get into the technical things like specific data collection methods. This might be surveys, observations, interviews, and so on. This is also where you'll deal with sampling and instrumentation. And you want to look for opportunities as you're thinking about how you will gather evidence related to the indicators you defined. You want to look for opportunities to measure the same thing in multiple ways and really build a body of evidence. And you want to be specific about who will be responsible for which aspects of the evaluation. So this really isn't a technical issue, but it is important for ensuring the plan is doable. So in many STEM education projects, it's not unusual for internal and external evaluation teams or pro program personnel to partner with evaluators to share responsibility for different aspects of the evaluation. So it's important to be clear about who's going to do what. You want to include timing in your data collection plan, so when the data will be collected. So both the personnel and the timing elements of a data collection plan are really crucial for ensuring the plan's feasible given the resources available for the evaluation. So that means time, money, and expertise primarily. Now, a lot of data collection plans will, will stop there, but I encourage you to push on and think through analysis and interpretation. If you really want to get to the answers to your evaluation questions, those pieces are really essential. So analysis is the process of transforming our raw data into whatever data that is into usable information. So this might include uh, identifying themes in qualitative data or producing descriptive statistics like means or percentages, or more complex things like effect sizes and correlation coefficients. But the point is to think of ahead on how you will analyze your data, because it will likely affect how you should gather your data, because not all types of data are amenable to all types of analyses. OK, interpretation. So Lots of times we talk about analysis and interpretation in one breath as if they're the same thing. They're not the same thing. Um, interpretation is how we take uh, the findings that we've produced through analyses and really turn them into conclusion. That is, again, reason judgments that address the evaluation question. So this little person in the photo has determined the height of the water in the glass in inches. So his finding is that the glass has three inches of water in it, but now he needs to interpret this finding to determine if that glass is half empty or half full. And we're going to get more into interpretation in the next, the last part of the webinar. So you want to plan out these elements for each evaluation question. And again, instead of organizing your plan by data collection method, um, organize by qu evaluation question. And that way, you can be sure you're going to have a reasonable plan for answering important questions uh, about the project that you're evaluating. 
Now, before we move on from planning for data collection, I'd like to show you a strategy that really will help you make sure you're going to be able to answer your evaluation questions with the data you plan to collect. So putting the data collection plan elements in a matrix format is really a wonderful way to make sure your plan is realistic and comprehensive. It's a real efficient way to show how the elements relate to each other. So I'm going to show you what I mean. So this table is for the evaluation question about the extent to which students are using career pathways. There is one uh, row each for two different indicators. You could have you know, even more indicators. This is just for illustrative purposes. So there's a lot of information here. You don't have to feel like you've got to read those. We're just going to look at one row. Um, and for this indicator is the number and percentage of dual enrolled student, students who intend to pursue degree and certificate programs. Now, as we move to the next column, we see that that information will be obtained from a survey of dual enrolled students. Under people, we have the external evaluator with responsibility for designing the survey and performing analyses, but the faculty will do the actual administration. The timing cell indicates that the survey will be administered at the end of each semester. And moving on, it says the analyses will mainly be uh, through descriptive statistics, but those will be disaggregated by demographic statistics. And the qualitative data, uh, analysis will be done through inductive coding. Now finally, for interpretation, conclusions related to this evaluation question will be reached by comparing the results we get um, from those data sources with the performance target set by the project using a rubric created for that purpose. And we're going to talk more about rubrics later. So the value of laying out your data co collection plan in this matrix format is that it forces you to think through what will be measured, the indicators, the constructs you will obtain data about, how you will get the data, and the reference points and processes you will use to make sense of the data and answer the evaluation question. Now, to further underscore the distinction between indicators, methods, and data sources, I'd like you to consider this statement. Um, the evaluation will include a survey of students and secondary analysis of institutional data. I could have plucked this from any number of evaluation plans I've seen in the past, especially the kind of real abbreviated plans that we see in funding proposals. I just want to point out that the survey is a data collection method, and the students and institutional data are data sources. That's fine, but it doesn't say what's actually being measured. So is it the student's satisfaction with their instructors, their intent to pursue a certain major, their demographic characteristics? We have no idea. And that's why it's so important to clarify what indicators will be used, then explain where and how information for measuring those indicators will be obtained. You just can't do that kind of glossing over when you use a matrix format for presenting this information. It really forces you to think through a lot of details and can save you from headaches down the road as well. Now, if you're doing an outcome evaluation, you do need to set yourself up to be able to determine whether or not observed outcomes are, in fact, due to the project being evaluated. So if you observe an outcome but can't strongly link uh, link it to the project, it may just be a coincidence, as Jane Davidson has pointed out in this quote. So you need to be able to show that the changes are actually caused by the project, or at least that the project contributed to the change. Now, some options for linking cause and effect include using control and comparison groups, so baking it into the, your design. Um, it's always a good idea to make some effort to learn about what else is going on in the project's environment that could count, account for some of the observed outcomes so you can rule those out. And I think an often overlooked option is to just ask participants, and I'm going to show you one way of doing this. So take a look at this question. The question itself. Sorry, this question um, is, is just asking students, how likely are they to seek a job in the renewable energy field? So this is a fine question, but alone it's not going to tell us about the project's influence, OK? But if we asked a second question like this, we're going to learn more about the project's influence on the student. So the question itself links the cause and effect 
and the response scale captures both the magnitude and the direction of the change. And yes, it's self-reported data, so not the strongest kind, but that's why we want to build a body of evidence drawing from all kinds of sources and methods um, to build a case for linking our project's activities to outcomes. So to sum up this section about planning and implementing data collection plans, just a few points. Align your data collection plan with evaluation questions. Develop concrete plans for analysis and interpretation, um, so you can really make sure those evaluation questions can be answered. And if possible, build cause and effect into data collection. And this can include just asking participants directly, which can be a, a, a kind of a, a real practical way to get at this. We do have some resources in our uh, handout. Again, the Getting to Outcome Manual, uh, I'm including that because they actually have a nice overview of some designs uh, to support outcome evaluation, evaluation designs. And Evaluate's Data Collection Plan Matrix is just a blank version of the template, uh, or of the matrix I showed you that has some additional um, guidance and definitions in there. And then we have, uh, finally, some links to practical resources on determining causation and evaluation. But now it is time for our second question. Thank you, Lori. It's Mike again. You know, um, we really liked your, your matrix, your table with all that information, but we're thinking as we write a proposal to an agency like the NSF, is there enough room to put all of that in? I mean, where do you make that judgment between the level of detail and the space it's going to take in a 15-page proposal? How do you manage that? I, well, I would say to actually save you space. If you really want to show linkages between questions and data sources and all that, um, it's a pretty efficient way to show that. And we just um, we put in a proposal last year, and I did use this approach in the actual proposal. And we were able to include our evaluation plan, I think, in about a page and a half, including the the matrix. So it's definitely possible. And I've shared that with people in the past, and I. We can share that in the follow-up. Um, but I would say even more importantly, you know, than putting it in the proposal itself, it's for planning purposes. So even if you don't put it in a proposal, you can still go through the process of um, delineating all the questions and, and indicators and methods and so forth. So make sure you have a real actionable plan, whether or not you put it in uh, the funding proposal. Good. That's a good comment. You know, many of us were struck by that that uh, slide that showed the connection between A and B, because it seems like in many of our projects, there, there's additional impact factors. And I think either you're going to be talking about that more, but it really struck it. How do you, how do you claim that you were the cause of, for example, being more interested in a renewable energy career when there must have been other factors? Or you just claim it and say, we're part of it. How do you manage that? Um, so, like I said, you can ask people directly how that experience influenced them. It doesn't mean they're going to give necessarily, necessarily an accurate answer. Another way is to look at um, students that are, you know, different class or a different site or somewhere else that didn't have the, whatever the intervention is, if you can, um, you know, if you could set that up in advance and actually have comparison sure. groups. I mean, that's a really strong way to do it but that's not always feasible. So then you're, you know, you're building a, um, a case. And we are going to look at a point, uh, an example later on, where we have several reference points for trying to interpret a data point. But it is worth, you know, like if you have enrollment going up in one program and you're only looking at one program, it's hard to make the case that your project was responsible for that if you don't look at other programs. Like maybe enrollment went up across a college in all its programs. So you want to be able to um, rule out other other possible explanations. You know, it may not be definitive, but I think it's definitely worth going down that road and, and making your case and using different types of data points and different points of comparison. Okay, good. That's a great point. You know what, Laurie, there's a few more questions, but there's some more question breaks coming up. Why don't I save them and you take us forward into the next section? I will do that. Thank you. So we... Um, I just pointed out you, you need to think about ahead about how data will be interpreted when developing your data collection plan. So this is about how you will make sense of the findings in order to answer those questions. And that's what we're going to deal with in this last part of the webinar. So let's consider this fictitious data point uh, from our case example. Our case was real. 
this data point is not real. I made it up. So let's say the percentage of women in the wind energy tech program is 15%. So that's 13 out of 85 students. So Mike, you can go ahead and bring up that poll. It's going to ask you, what is your opinion of this data point as a program outcome? Do you think this is excellent, good, fair, poor, or you really have no idea? Oh, I see. Many of you are not too impressed with this. A lot of people say they, they think it's a poor result or they're just not sure. How about if I broadcast those results, Lori? Oh, yeah, go ahead, sure. And I'll point out I have these little Fs to indicate fictional, and my data point is fictional, and later on you'll see these little Rs for real because I have a mix here. I, I had access to this project proposal, but I do not have access to any evaluation results. All right, so there, I believe the results are broadcasting. So nobody said it was excellent. Very few people said it was good. A few more people said it was fair. Most, the bulk of you thought it was poor, and a full third of you have absolutely no idea. OK. We'll put some context around that. It definitely is hard to interpret this data point in and of itself. I, I, you definitely experience that. Well, it just so happens that the proposal for this project said its target was for women to make up 10% of the students in the program. And that, also, they were starting from a baseline of less than 1%. So these are real data points from the proposal. So that really makes that 15% look a lot more substantial, doesn't it? Now, with the project starting in 2010, we know that that increase didn't begin until after project implementation began. And that's important because it will help support, not make it abs you know, uh, airtight, but it will help support the claim that, th that the increase is due to project activities. Now, another data point that helps interpret that 15% figure is that 2% of wind turbine technicians in the US are women. And that is also a fact that I uh, got from some um, national labor statistics. Now, while 15%, let's go back, 15% um, or so, uh, you know, maybe far from the 50% we would like to see, within this constellation of comparative data points, we can make more sense of this. We can more clearly see and substantiate that this is actually a pretty good result. Um, now, it would be very important, again, to compare with other programs or other situations because growth in enrollment, again, could be due to a larger trend of people going back to school. So we'd want to look at what's happening at, uh, with other, um, maybe other technical programs at the college. The point here is that data interpretation uh, really requires comparison of some sort. So this might mean comparing project results um, uh, for comparison in control groups, comparing project results with performance targets that the pr project set out uh, before they started, or with national data. You can look back in time and compare with baseline or historical trends. Compare project results with established standards of quality, um, and importantly, considering stakeholder expectations. And if you can use multiple uh, sources, as I demonstrated in that example, all the better. But whatever sources or strategies you use, that the evaluator uses, it should not be mysterious to those reading the evaluation report. Um, and next, we're going to look at one strategy for creating really explicit and transparent decision rules for reaching conclusions and answering evaluation questions. So here are the project's performance targets that were including, included in its funding proposal. Remember, they were aiming to make uh, for women to make up 10% of the students in the program, but they also set targets for the number of veterans and the percentage of um, minority, underrepresented minority students. Um, and again, these figures are straight from their proposal. OK, so remember what I had said about avoiding yes, no evaluation questions. Well, when you set specific target like these, which is, I think, an admirable thing, I think that people should do that. But when they are used as a sole basis for answering evaluation questions, again, it's really setting up the evaluation to say targets were met or not. And that can be problematic, as we've discussed. So let's think about it. Based on what you just saw, would you, as an evaluator, be comfortable saying that a 9%, having 9% women in this program was failure, just 1% away from the target? And especially considering that baseline was at 0.9%. 
Well, here's just a slight adjustment. So where I've taken those targets and just uh, stretched them out a little bit and used them to create a continuum. It's really not all that different, but it allows at least some more flexibility than just a yes or a no conclusion. And here's an alternative rubric. It's stretching out to four levels of impact. So the rubric labels are impact to match the evaluation question about impact. And I use the preset targets from the proposal, um, but you could also draw on a variety of information sources to inform a rubric like this. And then you get your evaluation findings, and you would apply the rubric to the findings. For example, we have, uh, if we had 15% of women in the program, that would fall into the high impact category. Then these ratings can be synthesized to reach an overall conclusion in relation to the evaluation question. So however you reach the overall conclusion, you now have a very clear uh, trail of data breadcrumbs, so to speak, to show how you got there. So here we have a conclusion that the project had high impact on diversity, and it's supported by the specific data points uh, from the rubric in, and the rubric. Um, and this is going to be a lot more compelling than sort of a wishy-washy conclusion like, uh, the project seems to be doing a good job in terms of enhancing student diversity. I'm sure many of you have seen conclusions like that in evaluation reports. And that can be OK, but not in the absence of an explanation of how that conclusion was reached. And I want to point out that rubrics can be qualitative, too. So in this example, we're looking at degree of industry engagement, which is a common, um, con a common issue in uh, NSF, especially ATE projects. Um, now, you probably wouldn't have much in the way of quantitative indicators on this aspect of a project, but that doesn't mean that you can't measure and assess it. So whether quantitative or qualitative or a mix of two, rubrics are just a tool for getting really explicit and transparent of how judgments um, of the program about the program will be made in relation to specific indicators or specific evaluation question. They basically spell out decision rules for reaching conclusions. Now, when creating rubrics or any kind of decision rule for interpreting evaluation findings, it's really important to engage with stakeholders. You don't want the evaluator off doing that um, themselves in their offices. So some tips, you want to do some background research on the program's context bring some facts and data points to the table, and really facilitate dialogue among stakeholders about what program success looks like. You can actually draft rubrics together, or evaluator can bring drafts for input among stakeholders. And you might want to actually try these out with fictional data to see how, if they're really going to work as intended. And, and you shouldn't be shy about tweaking them as necessary. It's OK to modify them. The, really, the most important thing is to document this process and the rationale behind these decisions and make it really explicit how conclusions are reached. So three main points to sum up this section, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. We want to answer the evaluation questions in the same terms in which they're asked. You want to be explicit and transparent about how conclusions are formulated, so you don't want to just dump a bunch of data points out and conclude that the project is doing a good job or needs improvement. We need some substantiation. And then also engage stakeholders in interpretation, especially you know, if you're going to create rubrics, involve them in creating those rubrics. I know I threw a lot of really detailed information at you in this section, and if you feel like it went too, by too fast, again, we do have the slides. You can just click the link to the right. It says resources to the right of the screen. Um, and you can take some time after the webinar to look, actually look at the content of the, the tables and the rubrics and so forth. I do have one resource for you on our handout about rubrics. It's a guide for developing and using rubrics in evaluation by Judy Oakton. Uh, again, so you can check that out when you have a chance. There's not a whole lot on rubrics for program evaluation. You find a lot of rubrics on uh, for grading, uh, like grading essays and so forth. I just want to remind you that the webinars are on Evaluate's website um, at the URL here, or you can click on that link to the right of the screen. Um, we'll have the slides posted, we have the handout, and the recording will be posted, as well as emailed to you in a few days. So Mike, what Thank are you, our Lori, final questions? Thank you, for all questions? that detailed information. We love that rubric matrix that you showed there. Here's a question. At the proposal stage, would you, how much of that do you put in the proposal, or do you leave it later for the evaluation analysis that you're doing? I think it's, I think, uh, proposal reviewers really like to see targets. 
um, instead of just vague claims about what a project's going to do. They want to know what your target is for things like increasing diversity or how many students are going to be enrolled or how many people you're going to reach. So I definitely think targets are great, um, and I think targets are a basis for uh, interpretation. So the, you can simply say that you know evaluation results will be um, compared against the targets. And I don't think you need to get super explicit about rubrics and all that. Um, you, it's good just to convey that you ha do have a plan for moving from data to conclusions, but you don't have to get super detailed at the, sure. the proposal stage. Another question, that. related question. You talked, and it did go by fast, but just for clarification, the question of using percentages versus numbers, if you say I have a 10% as my baseline number, or do you put the number of students, could you review your thoughts about that again, percentages, ends, how do you manage that? Well, I don't have a hard and fast rule, so I invite others to go in the chat box. So those um, in the proposal that I was using as an example, they had used percentages. So they had started at a baseline of 0.9% of women in their program, and they were yes. aiming for 10%. Um, That's just what they used. Uh, you don't want to ever have percentages without indicating how many people that is. You know, as, as others have pointed out, like, it is 10%, is you know, five people is 10%, you know, 500 people. So you do need to have numbers in there, but how, you know, as a reference point, but I don't have any strict guidance on whether when setting targets. Just make sure you indicate them, right? Is. I have another question that came up several times in the mm -hmm. chat window, and all of us know that as projects move through their timeline, things will undoubtedly change. Perhaps goals will change. Um, and there were some comments back and forth. I think it's up to the evaluator and the project team to make sure that the evaluation plan coincides with those changes and goals, right? I mean, you have the uh, flexibility to do that. Definitely. And um, our recent webinar on, I can't remember what it's called, but Kirk Ness just led it. And he dealt, he specifically addressed how to manage pro when there's changes in a project. Um, perhaps my colleague Lissa could put the URL for that um, webinar recording and materials in our chat. But, you know, that definitely happens. And the evaluation definitely has to flex with the changes in the project in a reasonable way. And that's really all about, always about communication between the project team and the evaluator. And when there are major changes, then it may be time to bring in the program officer to consult. But if they're just relatively small modifications, the evaluator and the project leaders can just deal with that and move on. But evaluation, evaluation definitely needs to have flexibility for um, being modified as a, as a project Thanks for changes. that response. One last question here. Um, you know, we're, most evaluation plans and so on call for an annual report to the NSF. Do you find that evaluators have an advantage by doing more periodic, like interim reports? Do you ever do that uh, as you work with a project, or do you know of people that do that? Definitely. I think if you're only getting information from your evaluation once a year, you're probably not getting as much out of it as you could. Um, we, we like, I know NSF likes to see projects using their evaluation to improve as they're going on, going along. And if you're only getting uh, evaluative feedback once a year, it's kind of hard to, to build that into a, you know, a three-year project, a uh, four-year project. So. Um, and, you know, sure. that feedback doesn't have to be formal, long written reports. It can be a conversation between the, the evaluator. It can be the evaluator coming to one of the team meetings and sharing some preliminary results and ask, asking thought-provoking questions. So a uh, very good point, Mike. I definitely encourage more than just uh, the, the, the annual report that gets submitted with the Well, thank you, Lori. You know, I think so. today you changed a lot of perceptions. We're so used to thinking about activities and helping us focus on outcomes and then how you judge those outcomes. I think that was a very important result of today's webinar. So that, uh, we're perfectly on time. Lori, thank you again for your presentation. Colleagues, I'm going to launch our end of the webinar survey. So please take us a, a moment to help us get better to get your input onto our process here. So here we go. I'm going to put up that survey link. Now, not every uh, computer handles this the same way. I think what will happen here is, for most of you, is now another uh, window has opened and the survey has appeared. 
Oh, I'm getting another link error here. Folks, allow me to correct this. I'm going to close that webinar. Lori, I'm not exactly sure what happened there. Let me take a moment for that survey link. Lori, while we're finishing, uh, yes, I, I think I see that. We did go to a different survey link here. Hold on just a minute. I'm going to get it if people want to um, have patience to hang out with us a little bit. I can get that link. I do not know what happened. Um, Darn it, Lori. That was my one fault. Of those? I thought I had that perfectly set. So give us a, uh, a, a moment, folks, for that. Yeah. Or I'm going to take us back to the presentation screen while we uh, check this out. So hold on just a second. You know, what we will also do, because I'm sure people have to go, we are going to send that survey link to you in um, our follow-up email with, that includes the recording. Perfect. Let's not worry about it right now. I know people need to get on with their day. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thank you again, Lori. I will try reposting that. Let's see if it works this time. And uh, thank you, everybody, for being part of today's webinar. We're going to go ahead and, and make this change to that survey link. That officially ends our webinar. I'll turn off the recording now, but we will leave that survey link open here as soon as I get it up there. Um, I can see there was a problem here, Lori, but we'll fix that. So thanks very much, everyone, again. That con officially concludes our webinar for today.